All right, everybody, and welcome back to the Started Somewhere podcast. Hope everybody out there is doing amazing. Now, today, I have a really special guest, somebody that I've known for, I don't know, maybe five or six years already. Yeah. Uh, and his name is AC Ramos. AC, welcome to the show, man. What's going on, guys? How you doing, Ross? Hey, bro, man, we were just talking all fair a little bit of everything that's going on. Uh, today, what's, I don't even know what today's date is. I haven't left my house in two weeks. The 25th today. Uh, the man. 25th of March, 2020, dealing with all this, uh, virus stuff, pandemic, yeah. it's getting crazy. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Hey, just like you said before, man, before we went live, uh, it's definitely giving us a lot of time to think about the things that we were neglecting prior to this. Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and also realizing the things that we take for granted, man, like shaking somebody's hand or just walking into <laughs> a store and sit you know, a restaurant and sitting down, man. It's crazy. No, I've been I've been meeting people like when when I do go out and have to do some I have to run some errands here and there. I went to the title company, closed on two properties a couple days ago, uh, that uh that are my rental properties and stuff like that. And literally, uh, there's no handshakes. I'm, I've gotten to the point where I just kind of do a toe tap. <laughs> like, hey, man. <laughs> Crazy. I went and saw so, the contractors at one of our big rehabs. Or con new con we're doing new construction. So I, I saw our project manager there, and I was like, hey, what's up? We give the toe tap. <laughs> Coronavirus <laughs> protocol. Crazy, bro. So I'm up here in Jersey right now. You're down in H-Town. So up in Jersey, it's, it's, it's a bit worse than it is yeah. in Houston. Thankfully, right? Thankfully for, for you guys down there. But over well, here, man, sure people are... Here. We just don't know it yet. <laughs> yeah, well, dude, people here are literally afraid to look at each other. Like, you go to the grocery store, everyone has their head down. They're, like, turning their face away from everybody. If someone coughs in the store, it's like the alarms are going off. I mean, it's getting, it's getting crazy. But uh, It's funny that you say that because yeah. Ceci went to get some groceries the other day. And uh, she, I, I was watching the kids and everything, and she, she wanted to, she had to go run some errand. And she's like, I'll stop by the store. And she said that too. She said, she's like, man, it felt so weird. She's like, I go in the store and I'm like, I'm pushing my cart, and you look over and you see another group of people, and they look down and look away from you. <laughs> yeah, bro. Like, I, I don't need to laugh because it's not funny, but it's, it's crazy, bro. It's like, what is going on? But, anyways, um, AC, you're no stranger to the game. Uh, we've been connected for years, man. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. And, you know, you're definitely somebody who, you know, myself and hundreds and thousands of other people look up to uh, in the real estate space. Uh, you've been in the game for so long now. So for the people that don't know who you are, uh, can you give us a little backstory on what you do? <clears throat> uh, well, I do a little bit of everything. So um, my, my baseline of a business is wholesaling. Cause, uh, and that's just because of my fundamental beliefs. I believe if you're marketing and finding your own deals, then your baseline is wholesaling. And then from there, you can pick off the ones you want to rehab, pick off the ones you want to buy and hold, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, my business consists a little bit of everything, but mainly wholesaling. Uh, I also do real estate education where I, 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 I am now kind of shifting everything up in that. Like I, I've been teaching people how to wholesale and start their business and then move into those other aspects for a long time. Now I'm actually starting to do more buy and hold with my mastermind students and, and more, uh, you know, kind of um, collaborating with more of my students that are, are, are at that next level, right? The ones that are, that are ready to, to buy and ready to hold some assets and actually have good credit. They have some, some reserves, everything like that. Right, right, right. Uh, and for the, People that don't know what wholesaling is, and maybe that's a new term for some of you, uh, can you just break down the wholesaling real estate strategy uh, in like layman's terms? So, so pretty much what it means to me for wholesaling, if you're going to be a wholesaler, is you, you have to have a marketing stream. You have to market to find deals so, or, or find a deal, actually, because I mean, some, some wholesalers don't even market. You just come across one deal, two deals a year. We have more of a business model for wholesaling, so it's a little different, but Somehow you have to find a deal that you can purchase or get under contract at under market value, uh, usually 40, 50, 60% of market value minus repairs. 
And then what you do is you find an end buyer, a rehabber, a, a buy and hold landlord, something like that, who's willing to purchase the rights to that contract from you. So it's not really flipping houses. It's more flipping paper, right? Mm. So, uh, so you, you get it under contract at a discounted price. Um, so you, so you, you buy it really cheap and you sell it to another, you sell your rights to that contract to another investor, still cheap, right? Usually about 70%, 65 to 75%. Yeah, man. Uh, wholesaling, it's just such a powerful way to make money in real estate. You know, um, yeah. I mean, I, I've been in the game now for going on seven years. And, you know, to this day, when I meet somebody that's brand new that wants to get started, I always tell them, hey, take a look at the wholesaling strategy because it's super simple. Right? It's not easy. It requires grind. <laughs> it requires hustle. But it's a very simple way to get into the game. Right. Yeah. Uh, learning the terminology, learning how to estimate repairs, learning how to value property. And it could be really quick cash for a lot of people. Um, you know, maybe somebody wants to make a quick 10 K 20 K. I mean, it's simple, right? The deals are out there. They're all over the place. Well, that's the one thing is, is they are out there. The biggest obstacle I find with my clients and my students is, is, uh, overcoming that the belief system, right? That, oh man, nobody's going to sell a deal, you know, at 40, 50, 60% of, of value um, minus repairs. And you, you know what I mean? And getting, you know, sometimes they, it's the overthinking it is, is the problem because if you just go through a conversation, talk to people, everything is in numbers, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I be, I'm a big believer in numbers, you know, so many, so many contacts, will get you so many leads, so many leads will turn into so many deals, right? And it's, it's just the way it breaks down. Mm. Yeah, man. I think I, I, I totally agree. That's such a, uh, an obstacle to overcome for a newbie is believing that somebody out there would sell a property for so much less than what it's worth. Mm -hmm. uh, but more often than not, right, these deals are actually distressed. They need work. They need repairs, right? And the sellers don't have the money to do that work and get top dollar on the market. So they need people like you and I or John or Amy out there to, to, mm -hmm. to, to offer them what they can actually get for that property, you know, right then and there. Yeah, I think yeah. <clears throat> one of the biggest misconceptions of wholesalers is that you're a vulture or you're taking advantage of people. Mm -hmm. And I it doesn't have to be that way. And I'm not saying there's not bad wholesalers out there. I mean, you and I both know that there are some people out there that will pick the bones of somebody that's in a bad spot. But I just truly believe if that's your business model, you're not going to make it very far because you know, you can only, you're not going to be, you're not going to find lay down people to take, to take, to be the victim all the time. Right. But if you're really looking to help people, that the money attracts to you, right? Like the deep, like, because if you're offering a solution for somebody that's legitimate, right? And you're helping somebody out of a bad situation, you know, you'll make money from that just naturally by providing a service and providing a solution. If you're out there trying to take advantage of people and you're chasing that dollar, I just truly believe that dollar will run from you. Mm. You gotta be ethical, right? In any business. Oh yes. You have yeah. to be yeah. ethical. And plus, you know, the majority of people out there ain't stupid. <laughs> that is very <laughs> stupid, you know? Uh, so yeah, I mean, being fair, I mean, even in my own business, bro, I don't wholesale too much nowadays. I'm more on the fix and flip stuff, but you know, I did do, a, I, I, I did my fair share of wholesale deals when I first got started in the game. And, uh, I, you know, I told myself I have to be fair, right? If mm -hmm. I'm fair, if I'm honest, if I'm transparent, I'm going to be, uh, able to win more and be more successful. Uh, I see a lot of newbie wholesalers out there, AC, they go out, they over promise and under deliver. And then what happens is the only person that gets hurt is the, is the homeowner. Right. When well, uh, the buyer, if they find the greater fool, cause sometimes what they do is, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this is you'll get an email blast or you get a text message from these, these wholesalers that aren't, you know, necessarily ethical about it. And maybe they, they, they overpaid in the first place because they, that's the only way they can get contracts. They don't know how to negotiate. They don't know how to have conversations. They don't know how to work the deal or work the lead. So they get it under contract too high and then they'll fudge the numbers. You know, ARV is this much when really it's this much repairs are this much when really they're this much, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, 
Yeah. You know, it, it's a, it's a, a find the greater fool theory is what I like to call it because what they're trying to do is find a newbie investor or somebody who's not as savvy and take advantage of them because, uh, you know, I've seen, I've, I've had people actually come to me and join my mastermind group to work with me because they've been taken advantage of by another company or another wholesaler or another investor. And they're like, man, I need to come to you now because I'm just trying to save my butt. You know what I mean? And it's mm -hmm. like, wow. You know, and I, and I look at this and, and, and it's pretty sad sometimes because you know, some of these companies, some of these wholesalers, some of these investors, they knew when they sold it to them that they weren't, they were misleading them. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, however, I'll also add that it is so important. If you're an investor, you know, if you're buying a deal, whether you're using your own cash, hard money, private capital, and you don't know how to do your own due diligence, mm -hmm. you probably need to, I'm not going to say probably, you need to go back to that drawing board and go back and learn how to do your own due, due diligence because you should never put a hundred percent trust into the person telling you a deal. Like that person's okay. in the business to make money and they probably don't care about whether you win or you lose. Uh, Especially if it comes down to the point, it's, 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 it's the only way they know to make money. And if they don't make that check, it's, it's, it's kind of the same reason that, you know, like there's so many wholesalers out there that want, like for me, I know I trust me more than I trust anybody else. Right. So when I get earnest money, I get it written out to me and my company. And if there's an issue and it doesn't close, I give the earnest money back. You know what I mean? I've never had a problem. You will never find somebody that said I didn't give them their earnest money back. You will never find somebody said I ripped them off. You know, I mean, you know, and, and by not giving them their money back or something like that when the deal didn't close. But there are wholesalers that as soon as they get that earnest money check, man, that, that check is gone. I mean, it went right to paying their rent. It went right to paying their car note. It went right to buying groceries. You know, whatever it is, it's gone. Yeah, man. Right. I mean, and reputation is so important. That's one of the reasons why you're still in business to this day. Right. So I also I believe at the same point, man, like the 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 the, the rookie wholesaler that's that's, you know, taking advantage of people, that's fudging numbers like they're just not going to last long in business. You don't really see those people around too much. Right. I mean, the people that are really producing results and, you know, building their reputation, in the community, like you, you, those people are still around to this day. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the, and some of them may still be around, but they're in the underground. They're, they're, they're not prevalent. They're not out in the open because they know everybody knows their tactics. Everybody knows their game mm. because there's a, or they, they move to another city and start doing it. You know what I mean? Like, and you, and you and I both know a few people like that, <laughs> That, you know, they, they, they took advantage of one market. So now they have to stay laying low and taking advantage of people so that they're not on the radar and, or they move to another city. You know, a couple of wholesalers that move to other cities because their name is burnt in the city they started at, you know? And, and the thing is, if you're actually doing the deal, real estate communities, it, it's a big community, but it's tight, right? It's a tight community. Like, like I know you, you've been doing this a while. You could call me, I could call you. We, if something goes down, we're going to talk. The, the, the head of other real estate companies here in town, I could call them. They know me. I know them. And, and it's happened before. I've had, I've had heads of other, other real estate communities and other real estate companies from other cities like Austin or San Antonio call me and go, hey, have you heard uh, uh, of this person or so-and-so? Because they're out of Houston. I'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know them. And they'll be like, well, what's their reputation? I'll say, oh, man, that person, they're, they're good. Or or man, that person, you know, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't do business with them. They have a reputation of, of keeping earnest money or doing this or doing that or, and vice versa. I can call somebody in another city and be like, hey, like, this person says they're from San Antonio. You know, what's your experience? Do you know of them? And they'll be like, man, they're bad news, man. Stay away from that person. Mm, yeah. I've literally had calls. Of I, I, yeah, I can relate, man. People have reached out to me also. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a reputation business, right? It's a reputation business got to be ethical. If you want to win long-term when you're dealing with other people, people's livelihoods, you got to be ethical and uh, you know, you'll make it, you'll make it far, but you take advantage of people and uh, eventually you're going to get exposed and it might not be so, so good for you. Right. Um, no, your, your name is the biggest yeah. thing you have in this business. Boom. If I, yeah, yeah, I'm working on getting a gong. So I see, <laughs> I see a couple other podcasts, they have the gong, you know, and I'm going to just, when somebody drops a bomb, man, I'm just going <laughs> to bang that gong. 
Yeah, that's your name is everything. Get air uh, <laughs> <laughs> but dude, so AC man, um, you you've been in the game for a while, right? You've been how many years now? In in, in oh man, you're trying to make me feel old now, um, dude. Uh, this year is now. I started in 1999. So it's 2020 now. So this is, I'm starting year, tw it was right at the end of 99. So right, I guess 2009, into 99, beginning of 2000. So oh, about 20 years now. 20 years in the game. It's a long time. Yeah. It's been a long time. You've been, you've been through some ups. You've been through some downs, right? You've been oh, through yeah. some downturns. Mm -hmm. And you've been through some, uh, some uptrends, right? A lot of investors right now are, are, are <laughs> out dude i mean we're all kind of freaking out but a lot of people are freaking out because for the last couple of years things have been going so well and now like the economy is turning to crap like yes so now they're cool. like oh shit like what, what 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 do i do and uh you know it's easy to uh it's easy to win in the up market man it's uh it's how you react in the down market that separates like the super strong educated so entrepreneurs from the from the weak ones or from the fakes Right. A lot of these pretenders are getting, dude, they're flooded out. They're out of business. Well, like you said, I mean, I was in, I was in this business wholesaling a lot of houses during the last downturn. Mm -hmm. So in 08, 09, there was like in, in Houston area, I knew, I knew of personally uh, of about 20, 25 pretty big time wholesalers. Right. Mm -hmm. Man, when, when 08, 09 came, man, everybody just got wiped out. Like everybody, there's, I, there was three major wholesalers that I can remember that were major, like, you know, including myself, um, Eddie Gant, who you know, mm -hmm. uh, was, was wholesaling. I mean, he's always had his lending and, and buy and hold stuff, but he, he was wholesaling a good amount. He still does here and there. Um, you know, so he, his, he was, he survived it. And Will Denker, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to meet Will, yeah. but Will was an awesome Will. cat. Um, yeah. And he's been doing this a long time too. You know, but those like are the veterans only, right there. Yeah, those are the veterans. You know yeah. what I mean? Myself, Will, Eddie, and maybe one or two other people that I can't think of right now. But man, that, that's pretty much it. But they're they're everybody and their mama was wholesaling mm. back in 08, 09 because you know, I mean, because they started in you know 04, 05, 06, 07. You know, you know when the market was you know anybody could buy a house and flip it. You know, you could buy it completely wrong. You could overpay for it. You could get screwed by your contractor, pay too much for the work. And the, the appreciation went up so much that you still made a profit at the end of the day when you sold it. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy stuff, man. Yeah, I, and I, don't, I, don't, I do not see this market being like that. Like there's a lot of panic right now, a lot of panic. And, and, and for good reason, right? You know, I mean, and, you know, the panic around the virus is one thing, you know, there, there's a panic around the virus. There's a panic around the, the, the market, the stock market, because a lot of people lost a lot of money because of the, you know, crude oil and everything that's happening there along with the virus. But I think right now, mostly this is virus based and it's, it's going to be a quick, quick in and quick out. You know what I mean? Like, and, and when I say quick, you know, maybe three months or so, as far as the virus thing, you know, hopefully they're, they're going to, they got a lot of smart people working on this. You know I mean? I'm, I am definitely not the person to talk to about vaccines or anything. I don't know much, but, but I'm, I'm trusting that, you know, I just see what's going on and there's a lot of smart people working on finding a solution. And, you know, I mean, they have a lot at stake too. You know I mean? Our government has a lot at stake, you know I mean? How, how long can they continue to put money in the market before we, everything collapses, right? So I, I believe they have a reason to find a cure. And, and then there's enough scientists and doctors working on that. that something will, have, plus the burn rate, you know, like with any virus, it goes up and then it, there's, a, there's a high peak of it. And then it starts, the burn rate starts to go down, you know, because people get, you know, start getting herd immunity, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? You start getting, your, your body starts adapting, you know. I think right now what they're doing that's causing a lot of the panic is because they don't want everybody to get sick at one time because like you were telling me oh, where you're at they they don't have hospital beds they don't have ventilators they don't dude they don't and it's, yeah. it's an eye-opener bro because you as as an american citizen right and, and i'm sure anybody in the world that's in a you know a first world country can speak for this 
you as a as a citizen put trust in the government to have the shit when you need it. Like if you need a ventilator, you know, God forbid, they're gonna have a bed for you, right? You go to the hospital, you know they're gonna take care of you. It's a really terrifying thought to think that if you show up to a hospital, they have to send you away because they don't have the equipment to treat you. And yeah. that's what Mayor de Blasio in New York City, the New York City mayor was saying the other day. He's like, we don't have the supplies. He's like, you're going to have to choose. And he, you know, he's telling the federal government, you're going to have to pick and choose who lives and who dies from this virus because we d- literally, like, we're not joking. We don't have the equipment. And that's terrifying, you know? So, or, okay. or like in our case yeah. here, they don't even have enough tests right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I was telling you there, I know people that are sick and they told them, hey, you, you probably have it, you might have it, but we got to save these tests for what they consider high risk, which is somebody who's, um, you know, sick and has asthma, sick and is, you know, diabetic. You know, I mean, I mean, whatever they consider high risk. So if you're, 33 years old and you, you have it and you go in with a, you know, respiratory illness and you're sick, they may not have the test for you. Right. You know? yeah, uh, hopefully AC in a couple of weeks, man, we'll uh, revisit this conversation and we'll be on that come down. Cause they say that the, 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 the peak is going to be in three weeks from today. Like, well, really? a few studies have shown that. I mean, who yeah. knows if that's really true. So three weeks from today. Quick. That's relatively quick. You know, I mean, thank you from when this started, if it could end and start coming down at that point. And that's why I don't think there's going to be like a lot of foreclosures and people thinking, oh, my God, this is going to hit rock bottom like it did in 08. I think they're going to wait for something that's not going to happen. Is there going to be a small window of opportunity right now as far as for real estate and deals and sellers? I think so. But it's not going to be like 08. I mean, it, right now it's the uncertainty, bro, because yes. if we knew rock solid, okay, three weeks, this thing's going to start to come down by, you know, by May, everything's going to go back to normal. It's a lot different than what we're dealing with right now, because who, who really knows when this is going to be gone? You know, I mean, if we're, if we're still dealing with this virus in eight months and people are starting to, man, and it starts becoming like the movies where like, it's like, oh man, like everybody's still locked in their house and you gotta, you gotta go to grocery shopping with a gun and there's martial law. I was like, man, I think we got bigger issues. <laughs> you know what I mean? Dude, yeah, I mean, it, but it, you know, it's, 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 it's sad for a lot of people. You know, I just, before we hopped on this podcast, I, I had a call with my buddy who owns a restaurant, small business, you know, small little cafe. And up here in New York and New Jersey, I'm sure down in Houston already too, they closed down all the restaurants for dining. Yeah, well, yeah, it's only takeout and, yeah, and, take and out delivery, on. I think. Well, I mean, who really goes to like a diner and orders takeout? Like, not many people. It's kind of like exactly. a sit-in kind of place, you know, like a cafe. So they're getting crushed. They're getting absolutely mm-hmm. crushed. And, and their rent, you know, I think he was telling me their rent's like 3 k a month. Well, Ooh. I mean, for a small business. That's a big chunk. That's a big deal, right? That's a big deal. So, you know, the, the uncertainty and the fear is like, okay, well, if we have to deal with this for two or three months, that rent's going to build up. We still got to pay it back. You know, we're going to be behind a few months. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal for, for, for the small business world, you know, even the, I mean, the big business world, the Fortune 500 companies, but I don't know. I think I was, uh, what I'm getting is there's going to be more aid for the more bailout for the bigger companies than for like the average, just Joe Schmo that owns like a small business. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't looked into it too much. Um, yeah. But I mean, us, you know, look, man, you know, another thing, bro, and, and I want to want to switch gears here, but I also want to say, bro, that this needs to be an eye opener for a lot of people because I am seeing people that are on the verge of like bankruptcy after only one month of, of dealing with this, like oh, yeah. entrepreneurs out there that are listening, like, do you not save money? Like, do you not stack money away? Like, like I'm seeing so many entrepreneurs that claim to make all of this money and do all of this business. And then one month of a, of, of a, of a, of a, you know, epidemic happens. And it's like, they're on the verge of, of being out of business. Like, 
you know, I don't I know, think man. It depends kind of on on your on your business model, also. I think like what you just said really hits home because you know it's it's an eye opener because like for myself and my business about three months ago, I mean, I just recently had a baby too. You know, you just had your baby. I mean, uh, we had our baby like a couple of weeks before yours. Yeah. And uh, I started changing things up in my business. Like I was just telling you how I, I built out a home office and I still have an office that's not in, in my house. I have this, I have my home office for me to work out of right here. And I have my home office that I built for a couple of employees to work from, from my house that I can keep an eye on them that I got to work closely with on my real estate business. And then, my other businesses, I have another office off the, off the freeway, you know, and, and a suite and everything over there so that I can meet people for business meetings and stuff like that. But I, I got rid of a lot of overhead. I used to have a 5,000 square foot office. And because of the baby and wanting to change my life and be around the baby, I think I was kind of a, a few months ahead of this curve because right now, like my overhead in the business, uh, uh, in, you know, as of January, like for my multiple businesses was like almost a hundred grand a month overhead. So, I, I mean, I could imagine if I wouldn't have scaled down for the baby and changed up my stuff and changed up my, my way of doing business. Uh, I was talking to another friend of mine yesterday about that cause they kind of did the same thing, but for a different reason. And they were like, man, could you imagine if we were still in that business model and having that high overhead when this hits, because it, you know, you know, people can't, people can't go to work, you know, they're not letting people like just freely do everything they were doing before that, yeah. that has a major impact. It does. It does. I mean, my, my, my advice for anybody out there, um, you know, you need cash reserves. You gotta have reserves in the bank. You gotta have that rainy day fund. And I know that there's a lot of uncertainty out there. A lot of businesses rely on day-to-day -day revenue. Like I totally get that. Mm. But for the entrepreneur out there, the solopreneur, have reserves, have cash in the bank. If you have, uh, if you, have uh, you know, bills right now that you're worried about paying, try and get deferred payments as much as you can. Uh, you know, push stuff back. Keep that liquid cash because you, 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 you might need it right? You might need it. And uh, I personally, my personal advice, AC, and I, I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. I would not take on a huge amount of debt right now until this <clears throat> kind of coming down. And there's yeah, no I mean, it, it, and again, there's good debt, there's bad debt also. But as like, what I'm concerned about right now is we have a good amount of rental properties, we have a rental portfolio. And right now, everything is good. You know, we're at the end of March coming up on April. I think everybody's going to be able to make their payments on April because not everybody has taken a hit, even though I know some people have, have reached out to me, some tenants with concern. And they're like, man, I haven't been able to go to work in a couple of weeks. I'm not making an income, you know, but there's also a lot of other jobs available right now. You can go work at the grocery stores who are, or who are sending out supplies and everything like that. Um, but either way, some of them are not having income right now. And April 1st, I think they're going to make their payments. But what about uh, May, June, July, if this continues to hit a little bit, you know? Well, Uncle AC is going to have to float the bill. <laughs> and, and truly, I am because you can't evict. I don't know what they did over there where y'all are at. But right now in Harris County, you can't evict people. Mm -hmm. No evictions. So if you can't evict people, what is your, what is their fear of wanting to pay? Except for the fact that we're letting them know, Hey, look, if you, we may not be able to evict you right now, but if you're not paying, you're not going to stay when it comes time for us to be able to evict you. You know what I mean? Like if you're not paying and we can't work something out and we know that you're really trying when we are able to evict, we're going to have to evict. And then you're not going to have this place anymore. And hopefully they value that enough to, to do it. But we can't evict as landlords. We can't evict as, as the owner of the house and the person renting it to them. But we still have to make our mortgage payments, right? You know, some companies- are the banks with, offering for beards? I don't mean to cut you off. Some. But, yeah, yeah, some of them are, but not all of them. You know, I was, my, my, my buddy yesterday, he, he's a, he, he was a member of our mastermind group. And now he has a pretty big rental portfolio also. And he says he's reached out to- uh, all the, the note holders on his, on his loans, like banks, private lenders, uh, even credit unions. He said credit union, the, the credit union he works with is not giving any forbearance because they're smaller. 
You know what I mean? They, they, they really can't afford to right now. Some of the bigger banks, you know, I, I, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, I think they're giving 12 month forbearance mm -hmm. if you're affected by the coronavirus. But, you know, what about the ones that aren't? And, you know, we still have to make payments and we're not getting income. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I just, I just sold my last rental uh, last fall, um, which like you, uh, I think I was a little bit ahead of this. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I, I'd probably be freaking out also, um, you know. Well, I'm still in buy mode though also. Yeah. Like, right, I mean, literally, it's, when we're done with this call, I, I'm talking to a, another member of my mastermind group who has cash and good credit. And uh, I, I have four houses right by the University of Houston downtown uh, or the, the University of Houston football stadium they built. And they, th they're awesome opportunity. I want to buy these four houses because right now, you know, the Southers in California, he's also motivated. Uh, we're getting a pretty good deal on it. Um, they're not in bad shape. We can go in there and with minimal repairs, new roof, paint, cleanup. We have four good rental properties. Mm, I like it, man. Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm still rehabbing. I, I have a house hitting the market this week, actually. Um, the good thing about where I, you know, where I'm at, I'm at the lower end of the market. I mean, you know me, I buy houses between 50 and hundred K and typically the ARVs are going to be at 150 to 200, you know, Pasadena, yeah. Texas. And, um, you know, the people that buy my houses at my price point, they're considered essential workers. So yeah. I don't see a lot of, I don't personally, I don't see my buyers, potential buyers being, you know, out of the market for buying a house. So, I mean, I'm still acquiring properties as well. Yeah, I think under 200, 175, 150, that, that range, you're still good. Yeah. You know, now you start talking about, I, I have a new construction project that's, uh, that, that um, it's, it's going to sell for $750,000 is what we were going to put it on the market for. We're, we're about two weeks from being complete on that thing. And it sucks because like, that's the market I think is going to take a hit because the, the oil industry is down, you know, and, and in Harris County, Houston area, we have, you know, a lot of oil industry dependent people, you know, either you work directly for the oil companies or somehow are affiliated with that, that industry that I think is take it, that is obviously taking a hit. You know, when you go down to 21, 22, $24 a barrel, um, from where we were at, you, that industry is taking a hit. Mm -hmm. And those workers that are the ones that would usually be buying this 750, $700,000, $800,000 house. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm looking at refinancing it with my lender and turning it into a rental, even if it's just short term, a year, six months, you know, what something like that. Get for that house in, in, in rent? Huh? I, I think I could get about 45, 4,000 to 4,500. And what's the square footage on it? About 2,500 square feet. Where is it at? Near the Heights. It's in Brooksman. Oh, Curtis, Curtis's territory. He actually, he's got, a, he's got, he, I mean, that's, that's where, I mean, I, I actually sold Curtis his first deal over there <laughs> whenever, when he first started. Yeah. Uh, but that's his area. Yeah. He lives in that area, I think, and stuff. Yeah. He's actually on the radio station with us too. He has a show. Nice. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's Curtis. Curtis yeah. is over there. There's yeah. a few other people over there, but the, I, I, I remember I was in that area way before, before that, before any of those guys even came around. I remember yeah. I was talking to Brant Phillips about selling him that property over there. Cause I was, I was wholesaling back then. And Brant was like, Hey, there's this guy named Curtis that's looking for a deal over there. And that ended up being his, his first deal over there in that area. Dude. I, I love those houses over there in the Brooksmith Heights area. Those, uh, the new construction over there is just beautiful. Uh, yeah. I mean, you don't really see that up here, up in the Northeast, man. Like, it's pretty, for lack of a better term, it's pretty, it's pretty ugly. It is bland. Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if it's a restriction thing, but, you know, the architecture, the architectural differences between the houses up here, New Jersey, New York, versus down in Houston, they get, builders just get so much more creative down there. Like you drive through a town and you drive through like a neighborhood, like in West university or the Heights, you see like every house looks different over here. It's like copy and paste. They all look the same. Uh, <laughs> and there's just not much, there's not even a lot of new construction when it comes to residential stuff. Um, you know, it's, I don't know, it's kind of bland. 
Well, I mean, I think y'all, y'all are a lot older than us, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, like New York, California, you know, and you see a lot of that there. California has some pretty good architecture also. Here we, we you know, it started very, you know, onesies, twosies, you know what I mean? And then you had some neighborhoods that popped, the neighborhoods that popped up after World War II, like Oak Forest and stuff like that. They had a lot of uh, copy and paste little, little houses and stuff that now they're tearing down and building these little McMansions and stuff. And, and yeah. you know, but I mean, I, I think that's, that's because y'all had so much dense population and had to, to cater to a lot of people right away, you know? Could Possibly. Be. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know uh, either. Um, you know, it's, I just, I love Houston architecture. Um, for anybody that hasn't been down to Houston, I mean, you drive around the loop and you'll just see, you know, townhouses, four or five story townhouses, big apartment blocks, you know, beautiful houses. You drive through Bel Air, you're seeing, you know, million dollar houses, which by the way, those houses, one, two million dollar houses down there, up here, those houses are trading for like five, six, seven million dollars all day long. I'm sure oh, that seven hundred thousand dollar build you're doing up here would be at least one one five. Well, yeah, and, and it you no, know, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Again, because y'all are ahead of us by so many years. Mm -hmm. But even in the in the areas of town here, like I mean you know, I used to live in the Oak Forest near downtown, near the, the Loop area in central Houston. I had a 1,400 square foot house. When I got with Ceci and now we have a baby and we have, we have five boys and we just had our first girl. You know, together we have five boys. That's so, a Brady Bunch over here, bro. Right? So we, we, <laughs> we had three boys. I had two boys. So we have five boys. And then we just had our first baby girl together. But um, so my house in the Heights, I sold that and sold it for like $315,000 for a 1,400 square foot house. And, and in New York prices, New Jersey prices, that's nothing probably. But, but here, you know, we're now in a $290,000 house in the suburbs in Cypress, Texas, that is 3,500 square feet mm -hmm. for 290 as opposed to selling my 1,400 square foot house for 315. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. crazy. It's it's all about location, man. Um, it's it's I mean, even in Houston, the price differences are definitely vast, like Katy, Cypress compared to West U, Bel Air. Hi. Um it's definitely like you can see the price differences, but even still, you know, the houses in West U, the houses in the Heights, you know, up here uh in the New Jersey, New York area, even over in like the San Francisco, LA area. Um, oh yeah the difference is, you know, that's what I tell people, like you want to buy a sick house and really get value, move down to Houston, Texas, uh, move to the suburbs like Katy, like spring, you will be blown away with how much you actually get for your money. Yes. You know? I totally agree with that. And you see, even around here, right in Westchester County, which is like where I'm from, $600,000 is getting you a distressed property. I'm not kidding. You. Like, we're not talking six hundred thousand dollars, and it's a nice, renovated, up-to-date, <laughs> modern property. We're talking that's a house that you and I would renovate, <laughs> and that's what these homeowners have to do. They have to buy the house. They've taken on massive debt, and then they have to renovate the house to bring it up to you know twenty twenty. So I mean, it's just the differences in markets. It's, aston it's astonishing. It's astonishing. Well, if you look at California, like we, you were just talking about California, look look at um. Somebody was telling me the other day, like, um, oh, what's that called? Um, what is the, the low income area of California? The, um, not Crenshaw, but like, Compton. Uh, Compton. Compton. Do you know what they, they, they were telling? I was just, they were just telling me the average prices in Compton. You know what a Compton house goes for? Like 15, 2,000 square feet? I don't want to guess wrong. Like 750 to up to a million or something like that. So, and this is the low, low income areas. So there's, there's three two, three, four families splitting the cost of this house and living together in these small houses. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, you know, two or three couples, four couples get together and they each get a room or something like that. And they're splitting the cost of this, of this house. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that's, that, that's crazy to me. That's, that's crazy yeah. to me. It's uh, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, you know, the, even even down in like Deer Park, Texas, where I buy houses, I, I tell people all the time, you know, I get the question, why do you invest in Houston? Why do you invest in Texas? Because the barrier of entry, for those of you that want to fix and flip real estate, okay, the barrier of entry is a lot lower 
in Houston, okay? And, and, you know, people may disagree with me on this. This is my belief, my opinion. It is easier, and I hate the word easy, but it is easier to borrow 100K than it is to borrow, you know, five, 600K to, to renovate a house. Like, I can get started and do a lot more deals at one time to buy a house for $75,000 in Deer Park, mm-hmm. Texas, and, 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 and make my 30, 40, 50 K, whatever it is, and do five, 10 of those at a time, then borrowing 500,000 to do one deal and make whatever, you know, whatever it is. So the barrier of entry, in my opinion, is a lot lower in these markets, like in Houston, where, you know, the houses are just, they're cheaper. Right. Well, you can't argue with numbers, right? You can, you can, you may not like my opinion. You may not like my haircut. You may not like the way I dress, but you cannot argue with facts and data. Right. Uh, and, and what you just said is right. It's not even a matter of opinion. It's, uh, you know what? And, and I got some investors from Cal- from New York that actually buy down here and we run their construction. We run everything for them and pretty much is turnkey, but they live in New York because they said the same thing you just said. They're like, man, I, I could buy a house for 500000 then I got to put money into it, and then I'm going to make sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 on it, you know? And we just, Ceci just sold one last week for, for one of our New York investors, and he's making, he's into it for, he bought it from us for one twenty four. he put sixty into it, and she just sold it for two sixty eight or something like that for him, mm. uh, you know, and, and that's on one deal that he's into for less than 200000 mm-hmm. you know, and, he, and he's going to make a good, about the same as he would make putting out 500 after, because the holding cost is more. I really think a lot of us Texans and Houstonians here, I tell them all the time in my group, like, we're spoiled. We're spoiled. Yeah. Uh, pretty much, man. Pretty <laughs> much. Uh, I mean, you go, you go around like Pasadena, Texas, right? Take a drive there on a Saturday afternoon. You will find so many potential deals, so many distressed properties that it's like a candy store. Like there, there, I've been doing this for almost seven years and I I never have a lack of deals ever. Yeah. Whereas over here, dude, I hear about people doing one deal a year because that's all they could find. Yeah. You know, and, and if, and, You got the big institutions buying these deals like clockwork. I mean, they're buying them like an hour on the market. Don't get me wrong. That happens down in Houston too. Uh, It's super competitive. I mean, the other day I saw a deal. I got outbid like in 30 minutes. I I, I offered what I offer. I offered like 75. They were asking like 90 and I I got outbid. It it wasn't worth, there wasn't, there was no way I could pay 90 for it, but I got outbid in like 30 minutes. Like I can't compete. You're going to buy that property for, you know, buy and hold purposes or whatever it may be. But um, there's just, there's so many deals down South. Um, But AC, I want to, I want to switch up the gears here, man. We've been, we've been going on for 43 minutes now, bro. And for those of you that are still hanging with us, listening, tuning in, really hope you're enjoying the show so far. If you are, please go ahead, wherever you're listening to this or watching this, Give us a review. Give us some feedback. Let us know what your thoughts on uh, are on what we have been talking about. And uh, hey, share this with a friend uh, that you believe can get value from this. But AC, I want to switch gears here, man, because we're talking a lot about real estate. We're talking a lot about what we're doing right now. I want to back up here. I want to back up because you have a really awesome come up story. And uh, I want to share that with the viewers. If you're, if you're up for it, Uh, But it is the started somewhere show. You know, you're talking about building houses for 700,000. You're teaching people. You have masterminds going on. You're doing buy and hold. You've been in the game for 20 years. Where were you prior to getting started in the game? So actually, I fell into real estate. I wouldn't say by accident because I always knew that was the vehicle that that most millionaires were built through and, and protected their assets. But I actually was coming out of prison for the second time at the age of 22 years old when, uh, when I got into real estate. My, my, my house of business, the, the house of operations, is actually the, the first house I ever flipped. And that was a, a friend of mine's house who, like, I, you know, I, I would cover the, the mortgage there, you know, uh, help him with money, and, and pretty much was renting this, this house from one of my friends and working with one of my friends. And when I went to prison, um, 
he, he actually, the second time he actually like, he, he was, when I got out, he was like, man, he's like, I lost my vehicle. It got repoed. You know, our friends don't talk to me anymore. Cause you know, friends are the first ones to go right. When everything hits the fan, mm. uh, houses in foreclosure. And, uh, and he was actually in talks with another company to buy it and they didn't even want to pay him what he owed on it, which I knew the house was worth about 75. They were offering him like 27. He owed 28. And I said, man, don't sell it. I said, I'll figure out a way to do this. And I uh, ended up buying it from him for, for, 20, uh, for 33. So he had some money. And then we put 22 into fixing it and sold it for 84. So that was my very first deal. And, and the, the way that I found out about real estate was when, when I got out, you know, I mean, actually, that, that was the first deal I did when I got out. I mean, and then I knew about it because I read books and, and saw some TV stuff. But that was rehabbing. And, and you and I both know that if you don't know a lot about rehabbing, that, that, can, that can bite you in, in the rear end real quick. And what happened is I got stuck in a property that we, we rehabbed, we put it on the market, and we sold it, but we sold it on our finance because the, the market was, we, we were a little over. We put too much into the purchase. We put too much into the, uh, into the rehab. Because like that was in 99 that I bought that first house when I was coming out of prison. So we did that for three years in 2003 is when we got stuck in this property. So at that point, I ended up losing everything because what I didn't realize is I had built myself a job. I built myself a job in the rehabbing. And then I ended up losing everything and ended up living in a storage room, actually living in a 12 by 12 storage room behind one of my family members' houses, my aunt. And she's, she's really more like my mom, you know, I mean, and I ended up, you know, living in this storage room. I had my wife at the time because uh, and we had like a four-year-old kid, uh, or my first son, four or five years old at that time. He was born in 99 also. Um, so I'm here watching this infomercial at night, right? You know, and, and in, in my storage shed, you know, with my hijacked cable. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and we actually ran cable from the, the big house into the, to the shed. And, we, you know, I had a little laptop and stuff. We had a TV in there. And I'm watching this infomercial at night. And it's like, do you want to learn how to flip houses? with no money, no credit, no brains. And I'm like, that's me. You know what I mean? Like I have no brains and no credit, no money. How much per more perfect can I be for this? And um, it ended up being the, the Russ Whitney program, Russ Whitney's uh, coaching group and everything like that. If, if you've ever heard of them, yeah. they, they were pretty big. Uh, he, he's like considered one of the godfathers of this kind of industry. Um, yeah. I actually got to meet him at an event, you know, about four about five years ago and I told him that story how going to his his training from living in the storage room and how it changed my life because that's where I found out about wholesale I knew nothing about wholesaling before that you know what I mean so that that's how I got into wholesaling is going to to that Russ Whitney training and actually my aunt was the person who put up the money for that so I, I didn't have money for it you know I'm living in a storage room my aunt has always believed in me like I said she's more like a mother to me and, and she put up, you know, the $11,000 for a three-day training, just three days. It was, you know, no, you know, not, no other stuff. You know, I ended up getting mentors and one-on-one and, and -on -one help later. But at this point, just to get started, it was $11,000 for three days. And all it was about was wholesaling. Just, mm. just the fundamentals, not even how to market, just the transactional stuff about wholesaling. And that's how I fell into to real estate wholesale. That's how I fell into real estate is by flipping my, my house of business and the, right when I got out and, and rehabbing it and doing that for a few years and then finding wholesaling through, you know, losing everything and, and going to that training. And, and this was in, in 99? In 99 is when I got, I got out of prison in June of 99. Right. And uh, I think the first time I went was in 97. Because all together, I did about two years, um, in, in a year and a half, two years, something like that. Uh, in 90, 99, when I got out in June, I, I pretty much just stayed real low key. You know, I mean, we, had, we were just having a baby. I was actually supposed to be in there longer. And my, my lawyer talked to the judge, everything got the time reduced so I could be out in time to see my first son be born uh, or my first child because we didn't know it was a son at the time. And it turned out to be my first son. Uh, so being out in time for him to be born in September and then buying that first house to flip in December, we actually right. bought that house in December of 99, rehabbed it and sold it on March 10th of 2000. Bro, you're good with dates. 
<laughs> uh, that's awesome, man. You know, AC, you said something a while ago. I want to, I want to bring back. You said that when stuff hits the fan, the friends are the first to go. I want to revisit that. What, what did you mean by that? Oh man. You know, I mean, when, especially in the lifestyle I was living, you know, doing what I was doing and, and there, there's a lot of, uh, and, and I think it goes for anybody that makes money in real estate. It was the same way. Like when I first started making money, um, you know, and anything that you're making money at, it, it's, it's weird. If you're not, if you're not focused on it, you're not paying attention. There's a lot of people that kind of come to you for the wrong reasons. They want to hang out with you and be around you for what they can get from you, what they can learn from you for free, what, uh, you know, what they can use you for. And, and, and that's kind of the people that I had around me before is I had a lot of people that were like, Oh man, good times. We're partying all the time. AC's paying for everything. This is good. This is great. But when, when everything hits the fan and I went to prison and there's no money coming in and there's no, there's, if there's no money coming in and there's no party going on, there's no reason to be around. It's the way they saw it. So people started dropping out of your life. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I, I don't, I don't have very many people that are friends. Like I have like two or three people that are, that I consider good friends from before I went to prison that, 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 that just to give you an example, I think three, those three people are the only people that wrote me any letters out of, I had like 15 people that I hung around and that worked for me and stuff like that before I went to prison. And I, I think three of them are the only ones that ever wrote me letters and showed any kind of care while I was gone and, and wanted to, to, to stay in touch and, and give me motivation and, and just, you know, be there for you. You know, everybody else was, you know, when you come out again, they're like, oh, hey, hey, man, I haven't seen you in forever. Man, what's going on? When are we going to get together? When are we going to party again? <laughs> yeah. And that's all. How, how did that make you feel, man, when people started turning on you? It, man, it, it really, it caught me off guard, to tell you the truth. Like, I, I really didn't expect it. You know what I mean? Because I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm going in. My friends are still going to be there for me. You know what I mean? Like, they'll write me letters. You know what I mean? And, and when you're gone for a long period of time, it's like you, you really appreciate those letters, you know, like yeah. every day I would wait, you know, for the mail call and be like, okay, who write me a letter today? And most of those days I didn't get anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can imagine, man. I actually, uh, I have a buddy uh, I grew up with and he's locked up right now, upstate New York. And they actually, they have a, uh, they have an app now called JPay, where I've yeah, you can, they give the inmates tablets and well, I don't know if, who gets the tablet and who doesn't. Anyways, he has a tablet. So I can actually email with him back and forth and you just load up money on your card. You could send them money to put on the commissary and whatnot. So I always, you know, make sure I, yeah, no, I, as I was saying, I, I make sure I go out of my way to, uh, you know, take care of my bud, you know, cause I mean, I've never been incarcerated before, but I can only imagine, uh, you know, it's a different experience, it, it, yeah. but you know, I get people that ask me all the time, would you change anything? If you, knowing that you went to prison and went through this and it was how hard it was, would you do anything different? And I can't really say that I would because I wouldn't appreciate everything that I do now and the way life is now if I wouldn't have went through that side mm -hmm. of it, right? You know what I mean? And it makes you who you are because, yeah. you know, you realize like the biggest thing it made me realize is because I thought I'm a pretty independent person. It's like, man, you know what? I can make it through anything I can. And I still feel pretty confident about myself about being able to make it. But what I did realize is I don't want to be locked up again. I don't want to do anything illegal that could put me away because I like being around my family. I like being there for my kids. I like, I like life. You know what I mean? The life that I built and everything. And even back then where I didn't have much, it was like my, it made me appreciate the freedom to where I didn't want to take any risks, take any chances anymore. Right. Yeah, I could, I could imagine, um, freedom, man, freedom is, uh, it's a beautiful thing, right? Yeah. To be yeah. able to do what you want when you want and, uh, you know, live the life that you want. And, uh, you know, I know for you, real estate and entrepreneurship has allowed you to get to, you know, where you want to be, or, you know, at least on the pathway to where you see yourself in the next couple of years. But, you know, AC, there's a lot of people that are listening to the show right now, man. They're just they're either getting started, they're spinning their wheels, right? They're like, man, I have been doing everything that I learned or uh, doing everything I was told to do and I'm not getting results. So let's talk to that person that's listening right now. You know, what is, 
what is one one tip like one super impactful tip that you can give somebody that's just getting started oh man you know it, it may sound cliche but it's take action because and when i and, and let me break that down a little bit because take action is what i think you need to do but when i say take action it's like if you've gone out there and you've taken any courses or you've been told to do this or do that usually it's do your marketing answer the phone you'd be surprised how many people don't even answer the phone when they start the business and they just you know you're not going to sit on your couch and nobody's going to show up at your door and be knocking and be like hey i got that ten thousand dollar check for you you know what i mean it, it doesn't work that way you have to put in the work you have to put in the action behind everything that you learn take action i like it yeah you always uh you always say um like your, your tag on on social media is uh don't talk about it be about it right? yes yeah be about do what you say you're gonna do right actually live the life that you talk about right and uh i think that's super super impactful man um yeah i mean just going back to you know where you were at and the struggles that you had to overcome if you had to do anything differently throughout that entire process is there anything that you would have changed well for me i think it made me who i am so but if i had to start over right now like if you took everything away from me i think this is a better way to put it if you took everything away from me now knowing what i know now and you dropped me in another city what would i do to make money is that is that a better way to put it yeah like you know for basically like is there anything that you would have done differently like for me for example if i could do it over i would have started sooner that's like my biggest oh. regret I didn't start yeah. soon. Well, I definitely would have started sooner and probably took some of the money I made from my previous ventures that put me in prison and used it for real estate then, you know what I mean? And then maybe I could have, but like I said, you know, going to prison made me appreciate a lot of stuff. So um, I don't know if I would change it, but yes, I, I definitely would have started sooner. I would have scaled sooner. Uh, I tend to be a little bit of a control freak, you know, where I, I don't think anybody can negotiate with a seller like I can. I don't think anybody can run the marketing like I can. I don't think anybody can manage things the way that I can. But, you know, now as a owner of a, a business and a company that now I have acquisition managers and lead managers and, and stuff like that, I would have delegated sooner and scaled mm -hmm. because, like, you know, when I was doing it as a one man show, you know, just the wholesaling part, yeah, after the rehabbing, the whole, just on wholesaling, you know, I could generate about 200, 200 to $300,000 a year in profit for myself. But that requires 30, 40 hours a week, maybe even 50 hours a week if you're doing everything yourself. Now I, ha I can run a company that makes a million to a million and a half a year and make 300, $350,000 off of that company was spending 10, 15, maybe 20 hours a week running it. Mm, I like it, man. I like it. Uh, next question for you, bro. Do you have any favorite books that you would recommend to the audience? Uh, one book that changed my life, besides the, the normal ones like Think and Grow Rich and, and The Millionaire Next Door and The, and the, uh, the, the Richest Man in Babylon, those, those are kind of, I think, the the foundational rails. Book. Yeah. 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 But the, uh, there's a book called traction. I don't know if you've ever read that or ever heard of it, but, uh, I haven't I think I actually got a, it's by Gino Whitman. I got a copy of it right here on, on my bookshelf right here. Actually grab that. It's a traction. This is one of my favorite books completely changed my business. Um, it allowed me to scale faster. It allowed me to scale more efficiently. It allowed me to delegate and, and, and the biggest thing it puts in place is numbers and, and it gives you tracking like numbers to track your business by. I just wrote that down. I need some books to read in the quarantine, bro. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm rereading um, the 10 X rule, Grant Cardone. Oh yeah. I read that uh, one. Yeah. I'm rereading that one and uh, I'm going to add traction to the, to the list. Yeah. I put up a post earlier on social media asking for some book recommendations. Do you uh, read or do you, do you like to listen better? I'm, I'm an audible person. Like if I read, 
I mean, I only went to eighth grade, so I'm not going to use that as a crutch. But no I, way. Yeah, I only went to eighth grade. I never went to high school. No way. Yeah. Bullshit. Dude, I went eighth to grade's the highest. I went to I grad I, I graduated I graduated eighth grade, <laughs> but uh, I went to 23 days of high school, and that's only because I wanted to play football. And then uh, you know I got into a, a disagreement with my coach and everything like that, and I ended up you know, bouncing through in those 23 days of high school, I went to like three different high schools. It was more like, yeah, it just wasn't for me. Like I, it didn't work out. Yeah. So I only finished that's, this grade. That's I prolific, played. man. You wait. So you've made it this far in business with an eighth grade education, man. <laughs> that's amazing, bro. That, I mean, that, that's, that just goes to show you, man, that self-education. I mean, look, I'm not advising anybody to not go to high school or anything, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> self-education persistence determination could take you far man you know I've always been an entrepreneur though you know what I mean like yeah. um I, I had a landscaping business where I, you know like cutting grass cutting is more like it was when I was like 13 14 15 years old that's how I bought my first car um is yeah. is, is I would I never even cut the grass just to tell you how much of a, of a business person and delegating and, and and I didn't even realize what I was doing at the time is I would get the jobs lined up for $35, $40 a yard front and back. And then I would pay somebody else, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks to go and actually cut it. So, yeah. and, and the reason it worked for them is because all they had to do was go and cut grass, cut grass, cut grass, cut grass all yeah. day long. And I would line up the jobs. Dude, so I love that. Yeah. I love that, bro. I love to hear like, entrepreneurial stories like when you first got started like because some people think like entrepreneurship is taught some people think entrepreneurship is just like part of your dna um i think people are born entrepreneurs man that's my i definitely opinion. think so i think there's born entrepreneurs and then there's learned entrepreneurism you know what i mean like some people can learn it and actually implement it but most of the time if you're not born with it it's harder for you to to implement it because it's harder for you to so maybe understand it. You know what I mean? That, 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 just that, that natural knack for it. Right. Like, you know, I would, I would sell candy and stuff. And when I was in eighth grade, when I was in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, like I would sell candy at school, you know, I went to private school. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, I mean, I had a pretty good education up to that point, but I mean, my family put me in private school. They put all their money together to put me in private school. So, but I would sell like, candies and stuff like that to make money at school and then um and then again went into the the lawn cutting and stuff like that and then i actually had a pager company when i was like 17 with my with my cousin selling pagers yeah pay, when, this is when they were high tech though like yeah like it, now it's like man it was, like, the, it was the cool the cool thing on the block was it the, oh man it was it was. On the <laughs> it was cool back there, then. you know so when i was 15 I, or 15, 16, I started my first business. I had a friend I went to high school with. His older brother owned uh, like a Salvadorian restaurant in town, right? And it served uh, food. And then at some of the nights during the week, they would throw like a dance party, you know? Yeah. So I went to him and I said, hey, I want to put a team night together at your club. And this is where I wrote the whole thing down. I mapped it all out, like literally on my uh, desk at, in my room. Yeah. This is how much we're going to charge people. This is how we're going to advertise. And I told him I'd give him a percentage of the door. Obviously it was, we couldn't sell alcohol. So just, you know, team night, whatever. But I told him like any, you know, beverages or whatever he sold, he would get dude. And I, I threw a party bro, and I threw, we had like a couple hundred people show up, man. I made, <laughs> you know, made some money and I did it again. I did it again. I did it again. And I don't know what, prompted me to want to do that it's like something in my in my dna just told me like hey you gotta you don't want to work for somebody you want to work for yourself you know you want to put the pieces of the puzzle together and i think that's what entrepreneurship is all about right we're we're creative thinkers and we build our own empires you know oh yeah yeah uh, i had a cousin that like she's she's older than me by about 10 or 12 years or something i think like that but she'd tell me, she tells me now because she's actually worked with me in the business, in, in the real estate business and stuff. And she's told me, you know, numerous times, she's like, man, she's like, you always said when you were a kid, 
you were never going to work for anybody and you were going to make a million dollars. And, and she's like, you, you, you've always claimed it. You know what I mean? And she's real spiritual. She's a minister now, actually. So she said, you claimed that and, and you were able to, to make it happen. You know, I actually, one of the things I did too, just kind of a side note is I was, I'm about 10, 15 years younger than all my cousins. Like I was like the, the baby, you know what I mean? The, of the youngest of all that whole group. So when there, and I had my money from doing my little business things when I was like 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. So they're going out to clubs when they're like 20, 22, 23, 21. Uh, I would lend them 20 bucks when they were short before their paydays came in from their jobs. And when their payday came, they had to give me back 25. I love it, bro. I love it. That's awesome, man. So AC, we're talking um, about the finish line now, bro. You know, the people mm -hmm. want to know what is next for you? Like, what does it look like? I know, I know right now we're dealing with the virus and everything, but beyond that, we're 10 years, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, what is AC going to be doing? I don't ever see a, a retirement, you know what I mean? Cause I think real estate is just one of those things that it, I meet, I meet investors now that are like 70, 80 years old. And, and it's like, are, are you going to retire? They're like, well, I don't really work. I just do deals, you know, and I make money. And I could see that, that going on forever. You know what I mean? Until I die, you know, doing real estate. Now, as far as the business of it, like coaching, mentoring, you know, like I, I just told you, I don't know if it was, if we talked about it in the beginning of this or if it was offline when we were talking, uh, before about like I, I'm I'm starting to fade away from one-on-one -on -one coaching and retire semi from from that because you know I'm I make a lot more money with real estate you know what I mean like I I did it to really give back and help like when I started coaching and, and, and training and everything you know our motto was and still is to care and contribute to the success of others mm -hmm. you know and, and that's what we do it for but now it, I'm getting to the point where I'm working with a smaller and smaller, smaller group in my mastermind. And those are people who want to work with me. And if they're wholesaling, I will set them up, train them wholesaling. And then we can be the buyers. And then the other group I'm working with is, is people that actually are buying because I'm buying and I'm working with other people and showing them how to buy. And we're building a portfolio and portfolios of assets. So I would say a better way to say that is in, in three years, I don't have to do anything anymore. But will I stop doing stuff? No, but I won't have to do anything. It'll be just for fun or a deal that I like or whatever. But that's the goal right now is we're building assets and building portfolios and I'm buying with my students who have good credit and good money uh, to, to pick up these assets and, and, and you know facilitating all these deals. And, that, that's what I'm doing right now. That's the, kind of the finish line in three to five years. Uh, three years, I think, really. But, it, you know, I, may, I might get there and be like, man, I'm a little bit poor. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to do if I don't do real estate. I love it so much. My life really revolves around it. You know, I'll talk to the cashier at the store about real estate for an hour if you let me. Um, so, so in three to five years, to the point where we have enough assets and we have enough portfolio that we never have to do anything again. You know, and that, that's probably around $20, 25000000 million in, in assets for, for myself or so. So how do you know when you are, when you've hit your potential? Or do you ever know when you hit your potential? Yeah, that's a good question. Because, I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's an evolving thing, right? You know what I mean? Like, especially in real estate, when you can... Like, like, like I just said, you can, you can continue to do it as an old person and, and, and buy another deal here or buy another deal there. But I think when you realize that you can do what you want and you don't have to do anything, right? When you don't, like, if I don't want to get up in the morning and go to a meeting and I just want to hang out with my baby and my girl and, and my kids or whatever it is, that I can actually say, you know, I'm not going, or I don't feel like doing that. You know, now if I made an appointment, that's different. That's accountability, rely, you know, being reliable and stuff. But I'm saying like, if I don't have to schedule anything because you don't need that income, you don't need that money, you know, which, which is good in real estate because, you know, I mean, technically there's a lot of stuff that I continue to do now that I don't have to do. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have to take on uh, clients. I don't have to, to, to work with people in the way that I do. 
I do it because it's part of what I love to do and it's part of a bigger goal. So I think your goals, you may say, okay, when I reach this point, I'm going to stop. But then when you reach this point, you're like, oh man, it's, it's so much fun and I don't have to do anything else. But man, I really like this goal out here. And then maybe it's like, oh, I really like this goal over here. You know, so I, I think that's, that's for me, that's the way I see it is, you know, I mean, because there's a lot of stuff I do now that I really don't have to, you know, like I said, I make a lot more money with real estate than I do with coaching or helping people do stuff. But I love to do that. And I love when somebody comes to me and they're like, man, I just did my first deal. Or they're like, man, I just quit my job. Or, I, you know, and I have several people that make a million dollars a year in their business. Several of my students make a million dollars a year in their business. And when somebody comes to you and tells you that, that's pretty fulfilling. Feels you know good. I mean? I'm more excited to hear that from people than, than sometimes about closing a big deal on our own. Yeah, I agree, man. Knowing that you had an impact on somebody's life and, you know, their business life and, you know, their success, man. It's, it's like, it's indescribable. It's a good feeling, you know. Um, I had I a friend that called me the other day, made me cry. She, she, like, literally, she called me and I was driving and she was like, she's like, AC, I just want to tell you, she's like, I've been doing this with you for three years now, four years now. She's like, and I didn't even realize until my husband was doing our taxes that we're multimillionaires. <laughs> and, like, I never thought of that. Like, we own so many houses free and clear, and we're multimillionaires. And so, like, what you just said is having that impact on people, that, that I love the impact. But then she said, our son, who has a medical condition that, like, he, he could work, but he has a medical condition, and he's, like, 27 or 30. I think he's, like, 30 now, maybe. Uh, maybe a little bit older, a little bit younger, somewhere right around there. She's like, he worked with us in the business and he started buying properties and he started building his assets and he never has to work again. Mm. He, never, he has a network of a net worth of a half a million to a million dollars in properties and never has to work again. And, and she said that to me, she's like, I thank you for what you did for us, but I thank you for what it meant for my children. And that, like, literally, when I got off the phone from there, I was like, there was a tear coming down from my eye while I was driving. I was like, because that impact is one thing, but when they pass it on to their children and everything else, that's legacy, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree, man. That's amazing. You know, AC, there's going to be a lot of people, bro, that are listening to this right now that are going to want to connect with you. They want to reach out, you know, give you props, ask you questions, whatever it may be. Uh, what's the best place for somebody to reach out to you? Oh man, you can always find me on Instagram as one place. And that's a uh, AC underscore Ramos, R A M O S underscore. So AC underscore Ramos underscore or on Facebook at AC Ramos. And, uh, you can look at our website, uh, prosperitygroup.com. Prosperitygroup.com. Yeah. And I'll link that guys, uh, all in the show notes. Now, you see, I got one last question for you, man. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to think about this question before you, before you jump on it. Uh, and the question is, in your 20 years in business, matter of fact, your entire life, <laughs> what is the best advice that you've ever received? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one, man. Um, I, I think it would have to be don't stop because, you know, there's, there's a lot of times in life that, you, you know, like when bad things happen when I was younger and I was going to prison and all that stuff, it's like, you feel like everything's against you. You feel like everything's over, you know, in, in the crash of 08, 09, you know, I, I lost about a hundred thousand dollars of my own cash in seven months during that, that downturn. And it's like, man, you feel like everything's against you. But in, in no matter what circumstance you're in, you only lose if you quit. Mm. You only lose if you stop. Just don't stop. Drop a bomb for that one, man. That was awesome. So uh, don't stop, guys. Uh, and AC, man, I want to thank you so much for being here on the show, bro. I had, a, I had a great time. Hour and 15 minutes, my man. Pure yeah. value, pure content. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks it feels for like me, man. You know, man, 20 I, I, minutes, I, right? <laughs> I love you, bro. So yeah. Anytime, anywhere, any place, just let me know what you need. Absolutely. And uh, AC, uh, one last thing. You have a show of your own. 
and mm -hmm. uh, you have a podcast and you do the radio. Where can people tune into that stuff? Yeah, so the podcast will be released soon. Uh, that's Alien Education. It's a uh, you know business uh, business focused, and then our radio show is on ten seventy a.m. Texas Real Estate Radio Network, and our show is called REI Wholesale Academy, and it it airs on ten seventy a.m. on Wednesday night at ten p.m. Awesome, awesome. All right, man. With that being said, uh, I'll see you later. Take care, man. Later.